And so if you look at this form, and you look at it at low tide, or the same spot at high tide, Tomales Bay, imagine the form, this crenellated, undulatory, sinuous, serpentine, slightly supple and sensual expression of this snaky space, right? <laughs> That's oscillating, interdigitating between in a place of deposition and erosion as water twice a day aqueously inhales and exhales in a tidal bulge that wraps around the planet with a big part and a skinny waist, high and low tide. Twice a day, every coastal interface is going through this bathing process, high and low, and left to its own devices in a low gradient system, the discussion between land and water will give us this form, right? It'll get really crazy over time. You get these torturously meandering creeks and flat bottom, flat valley bottoms. Every flat gradient system on the planet, from the Arctic to the Amazon, will, you'll see creeks that do crazy things like this, right? And make oxbow bends, and old ghost bends are here, about to make one there, about to make one there. There's an old one, old ones, old ones. And, and there's this whole concept of time, fascinating notion. This stuff happens through time, and these systems are living and dynamic and evolving and moving and changing. And, and then we want to put a vineyard next to one or a housing development next to one. We're going to have to channelize it and make it go straight and make it go faster because we want to develop up to the edge of bank. And I think human, we're going to have to sort this discussion out because nature bats last. And water, water will ultimately regain whatever it wants in the long run. And New Orleans is the great case study for us in America at this point. I won't belabor the hydro illiteracy of the development of that city with respect to its location and design. But I love the city, no hard feelings, but it's not going to stay around as a big city in the long run. So then you get into a pattern like this, right, where it's a satellite image of snow up on the mesas of the Grand Canyon. Actually, no, it's a scanning electron micrograph of the the capillary bed in the end of your finger, or the neural pathway in your brain, or it's actually your lung, bronchial, alveoli system, right? Or it's actually just looking up into a tree in the Costa Rican rainforest, right? It's this whole notion of fractals, dendritic branching fractals. And again, they're scale independent from full watershed erosional features to deltaic features to arboreal features to cerebral features to capillary features to bronchial features. And it's a distribution, concentration and distribution pattern. Concentrating energy, moving it, transporting it, and redispersing it in every form. And water's the lubricant that drives every one of those. And so as someone who's trying to figure out how do we redevelop human landscapes, I mostly spend time on this, that it's worth the concept of us studying biomimicry or hydromimicry or ecological emulation. And if we can derive patterns of development out of what life's been doing and geology's been doing for a long time, maybe we'll get around to something better, more responsive, more adaptive. I think this study generally, if you look at indigenous cultures all over the planet historically and currently, you'll find a pretty deep-seated area within the culture of a, a level of reverence for the relationship of that which rehydrates, this water. And so this gentleman here in the Ganges River in the Kumela Festival, 35 million people in a single day in one river all celebrating. Imagine that's the population of California all in one river on one day. Bring it on. If Schwartzy could pull that off, I'd actually vote for the guy, right? <clears throat> or this beautiful water temple in Tambo Machai above Cusco in Peru, pre-Incan temple. I think in America we've got this deep connection to water as well, right? We're really <laughs> into it, if you will, right? There is that phrase that the solution to pollution is dilution, and I guess when that comes to getting a jelly donut down the gullet, some pure water is a handy thing to have. <laughs> it's a good business model. In the permaculture world, it's, it's called stacking functions and relative location. <clears throat> but what you get in the end here is that the water cycle and the life cycle are the same cycle. Right? No water, no life. 
It's the same cycle. And sustainability then gets broken into two terms and flipped over and begged as a question. What are you striving to have the ability to sustain? And if the answer doesn't come back, the cycles of life, the hydrologic cycle, the earth, air, fire, and water cycles, nutrient cycles, procreation of cancer-free, healthy hominid cycles, take your pick. Right? We, we, we're, if our development compromises the cycles of life, I would argue by definition it's an unsustainable endeavor. So a wonderful uh, person that everyone should read is Aldo Leopold, right? Start with Sand County Almanac, the land ethic. And Luna Leopold was one of his sons who was an emeritus professor from Berkeley, a hydrologist, and unfortunately recently passed away. And this quote works for me because it's like, okay, water's critical, our lifetime or children's lifetime, great. The health of our waters, here we go, the principal measure of how we live on the land. And that you find a benchmark upon which you hold up your capacity to evaluate the efficacy of your settlement pattern. And water is an unrelenting truth teller. And is the quantity and quality of the water in your place better for your having been there or not? It's a pretty, it's a pretty simple question. The carrying capacity of that system, is it better or not for your settlement pattern? And then you get into this one, and I was glad to see the woman, I'm forgetting her name, uh, who's going to be talking about climate change for you. So this was last year data from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, who co-received the Nobel with Al Gore. Unequivocal in their world means greater than 90th percentile of confidence in their scientific community about global warming and the fact that observations that we're having increase in average air, ocean temps, widespread melting, snow, ice, and rising global mean sea level. And when it rises, it's going to be mean. It doesn't say global nice sea level. It's the mean sea level, right? <clears throat> what do all of these indicators have in common? They're all water-based indicators. Even air temperature is a water-based indicator because it's about increased state of water in a gaseous form. Right? Hot air holds more water. Right? We, we all know this, how that works. Tropics, think about it. This is all water-based stuff. Planet water has no other means to manage the increase of heat because of this thickening atmospheric blanket than to begin to sweat and begin to move its water cycle. And it's going to melt the poles and it's going to melt the ice caps and it's going to change that ratio from 97% salt water and too solid to more salt water. Right? So we're tweaking, the water's not going away, it's just we're tweaking the percentages of how the planet stores it in what phase state. And what we're ramping up is the saline liquid part and the gaseous part, and what's going to be really interesting is the solid part. And I saw on the, there was two different slides happening and the one talk about the climate change talk where there, her thing was saying the predictions from the model is 70% reduction in snow in the Sierra, right? But we don't have to listen to the scientists and tell us that, right? <clears throat> right? There's this thing, if form follows function, fashion follows function as well, right? I mean, it's an, it's an age-old thing. Some of us were just in Brazil, and I can tell you the bathing suits are a lot smaller than that on Ipanema Beach, right? <clears throat> so all of this is an inconvenient truth, and I think, you know, the wake-up call, and here we are in our little our little island, California, what an amazing spot, and you know, Santa Barbara down here, and this whole system, and it's quite a thing, quite a place, it's an amazing place, and it makes some critters out there wonder what we're up to, right? <laughs> it's like, are you, when are the hominids going to get it squared away, and is it safe to cross the lily pad? It's not clear, right? <laughs> this is the Pacific Northwestern pond turtle, but so let's go back to that factoid. 70% loss of snowpack by mid-century in the Sierra Nevada. 80% of all of California's developed water supply comes from snowmelt from the Sierra Nevada. And we're talking by mid-century, there will be 70% less of it. Ooh, that's kind of a crunch, crew. <laughs> 